living in us. We can be changed. We should be changed by the power of his love because it's incredible. I want to pray before I start my message this morning. I don't know if you follow the news or how closely you follow the news, but there was yet another shooting today. Three police officers were killed this morning in Louisiana and two are fighting for their lives. And, and that hits home, you know it hits home to me. But it hits home more because those are lives and those are souls that are being lost. And I'm tired of losing in the battle. And the message is timely. It's, it's been brewing in me, gosh, maybe a month or more. And when Pastor asked if I could speak in his absence today, I thought, yeah, I, I think now is the time for those words to come out. So, Father, I just thank you for this word. And, God, I'd ask that you bless my brothers and sisters. God, equip us and charge us and ignite us not just to make a difference, but to be the difference. And Spirit, have your way this day. I would that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up and that the kingdom of God would be advanced in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Paris, Nice, Louisiana, Minneapolis, Dallas, they're all painfully familiar to us, aren't they? And you add to them what looks to be one of the most historic presidential elections ever, really for the perceived incompetence and lack of appeal for the two front runners. I've heard multiple conversations and I've been a part of a handful of discussions about the upswing in crime and the downward spiral of ethics and morals. I spent more than a fair share of my prayer time devoted to this issue, as I imagine many of you have. Much of my prayer is asking God, how is a Christian supposed to respond in times like this? The three most common responses that I've noted in those conversations are anger, fear, and despair. And I want to look at those three in light of scripture. And I want to argue that none of those three in and of themselves is an appropriate response. And I want to challenge you to find a way to respond in a more godly way. So let's start with anger. I'll admit, I get angry over these things. Because these are human lives and souls that are being lost. But God's word has a lot to say about anger. There are three specifically, I think, that provide instruction on a Christian attitude. We'll start in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 17 says, A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of wicked intentions is hated. So it's telling us, church, to be slow to anger. Now, if you look at the verse, you can see why. When you're angry, it tends to make you do foolish things. 
We've all heard the phrase blinded by anger and we know exactly what that means. When we lose control of our emotions, we have a tendency to act according to our sinful nature. We go to the gut level and it's not very pretty. Blinded by anger is not the place to be. When overcome with anger, we can't see straight. We don't. We, we see red, and you can't see well when you're looking through red. We're blinded by our anger, and we, we, we often, most often, if we're doing that, respond foolishly. And we do things that we are quick to, to regret. Thomas Jefferson once said, when angry, count to ten. When very angry, count to 100. What he's saying, church, is stop. When you're angry, stop. Stop until you regain control of your emotions, because if you don't, you're going to take action that you're going to regret. Now, most of us understand road rage. Road rage is uncontrolled anger. People who can't control their anger do foolish and often deadly things that moments later they regret and lives are changed forever. That's a person not in control of their emotions. The second and third verses that talk about the Christian attitude to anger are found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. You see him there making reference to the fourth psalm. He says, be angry and don't sin. In Psalm 4, verse 4, it says, be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart and your bed and be still. So Paul's citing it here. Be angry and don't sin. It indicates there's a proper anger, but proper anger is not sinful. There is enough, more than enough to be angry about today. We should be angry. We should be angry about all these senseless deaths. But it can't be followed with sinful, angry acts. That's what happened this morning in Louisiana. Somebody foolishly in anger responded. They didn't follow what they were instructed to in Ephesians 4. I'm not sure they could find Ephesians 4, but Lord help them find it. Meditate on God's word and be still. Do you know what that does for you? You spend time in God's word thinking about his word and it lets you regain control of your emotions. More than that, it gives you God's perspective on things. Paul's instruction back in Ephesians 4.26 adds a second piece for us to consider besides meditating on God. It says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. The danger is the longer we hold on to our anger, the less likely we're going to manage it rightly or the less likely we're going to manage it at all. How many times have you been angry and you didn't want to act and you just didn't feel like you could, so you stuffed it down inside of you? And you never acted on it. Do you realize what it's doing down there inside your belly? Burning. And it's corroding. And it's eating at you from the inside out. And I guarantee you it will find a vent. We're not supposed to let the sun go down in our anger. We're not supposed to hang on to our anger. The danger is the longer we hold on, the worse it's going to be. And if you looked at the next verse, it would tell you that if you leave your anger unaddressed, the devil gets a foothold. When the devil gets a foothold on your emotions, he begins to play them. He twists them. He uses them like a knife. He begins to pro and, and jab and, and, and put holes and then twists it doing the greatest amount of damage he can, when if it had been handled rightly and gone right to God, all that could have been avoided. So when you're angry, go ahead and be angry, but take it to God and put it under his control. Get your marching orders, get your direction from God, and then you'll know how to handle anger. You'll also get it under control. It's a good reason to take the anger to the Lord. He's the only one who can handle them the right way. We can't. We do not have it in us. We tend to pop. You ever seen a firecracker or a fireworks after it's exploded? It's not very pretty. It's fragmented. It's filthy. And it's useless. 
God alone can handle our anger. And I found that when I take my anger to God, he takes my anger away from me and puts his peace in its place. There's the kicker. The third reference is in Ephesians chapter 4, 31. Look at it. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, let them be put away from you. Now, what's interesting is that this passage of Scripture, these few verses around Ephesians 4.31, are a reference where Paul is speaking specifically to the church about not grieving the Holy Spirit. Your anger, mishandled, grieves the Holy Spirit. Paul says, put it away. Righteous anger has its place. It should spur us into action, but it should be God-directed action. Anything less than God direction to our anger is offensive to the Holy Spirit who's living in us. Uncontrolled anger, unrighteous anger, puts a wedge between you and other people. Now, we as the church are supposed to reach out to others with the love of Christ. But if we're reaching out in anger and the church and the unbelievers are watching us, we're putting a wedge between us and them. They are not going to want to get near us because if you are unrighteously angry and spewing, what you're telling me is you're not safe. Proverbs even talk about that. It says, go away from a man who's, who's controlled by anger. He's not safe. She's not safe. Why don't we grieve the Holy Spirit, but we, we, we short circuit and cut off our potential for serving God in the kingdom of God. And then again, it pushes the Holy Spirit away from us. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what, if you're going to walk around in anger, he's going to take a vacation. He is not going to stay in the presence of unbridled anger. It's offensive to him. Second one of responses is fear. Fear is a typical response to the unknown, isn't it? It's been said. We fear we don't know. But you know, there's more than enough of the unknown facing us right now. But did you realize that in the unknown, there's always one known? In all of your unknowns, there's always one known. God is on the throne. And God is in control. Hmm. Whether it feels like not, feels like it or not, everything that's going on in our world has been allowed by God. And I'll guarantee you these things that are going on that we don't like, he doesn't like it any more than we like it. But he gave man free will. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, sin echoed out for all eternity. Until, and there will be an until, there will be a day when God says enough. He is a God of redemption. And scripture tells us there will come a time when he puts all things back the way they were meant to be. There will come that time. He will make it right. While I was praying and, and contemplating on this, I had a four-hour drive or a three-and-a-half-hour drive to pick up the kids on Friday morning. It was a nice drive because it was quiet. And the sun was out and the mountains were out in all their glory. They were out in their glory way back, too. It just wasn't so quiet. So the Lord and I just talked, and I, and I felt like he was impressing upon me a question. He said, what's the opposite? What do you think is the opposite of fear? And my first thought ran to peace. But the more I thought about it, the more I contemplated, I thought, no, it's not. The opposite of fear is courage. The opposite of fear is courage. Now imagine Joshua. You all know Joshua, Moses' right-hand man. Imagine how Joshua was feeling the days after Moses died. The leadership role of all the Israelites had fallen to him. Now Joshua wasn't a young guy. I don't think at this point in his life, and they spent 40 years in the desert. We know he's well over 40. I'm guessing he's around between his 60s and his 70s. So he's not young, and he's not inexperienced, but he's never been in leadership before. He's never borne all the responsibility on his shoulders, and he had to take this multitude of people who failed to go into the Promised Land before, and it cost them 40 years. He had to get them geared to go into the Holy Land. Look at Joshua, the first chapter, in verses 6 through 9. I can't see it all there, but it says, Be strong and of good courage. Three times... Three times, God tells him, be strong and of good courage, don't fear, and don't be dismayed. But in those verses, there are some phrases you really should take note of. 
There's the verb, or the verse, or the phrase, you shall. I, God, swore that you may, and for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I see those, church, as promises. In the midst of your challenges, in the midst of your struggles, you shall. That's implied that you're going to do this, Joshua. I swore, God promised that you may. God is permitting it. You know the difference between may and can? May is permission. Can is ability. God is saying, you got my permission. And that great one, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Church, we do live in challenging times. And at times, those are fearful. But we can stand in those same phrases. If you're not seeing things clearly, Brother James is a photographer, and he knows that if you're not seeing clearly, you can't get that picture into focus. He knows what you have to do. You have to adjust the focus. Adjust the focus in your life until you're not seeing fear anymore. And for us, church, that means we put our focus on God, the author and finisher of our faith, and not on the thing that we're scared of. There are lots of things that frighten me, but none of those things are bigger than my God. It's when I look at those things that I begin to quake and shake. But when I look at God, I, I get more solid. I get more confident and fear can't be there. Put your focus on God, not on the fear. The same God who was there for Joshua is here for us. Those same promises, you shall, I swore, that you may, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Those are your promises. Your God is bigger than your fear. When you fear, feel fear trying to grab hold of you, and it will, it will try because that's one of Satan's favorite weapons, try applying some scriptures to it. Look at Isaiah 35, verse 4. Jot these down. Hang on to them. Say to those who are fearful, be strong, don't fear. Why? Because your God will come with vengeance, with recompense, and I love that, he will save you. He will save you. God will one day make all things right, and God is our Savior. When fear gets too big, run to your Father God. Run to Daddy God. He's bigger than the fear. And fear, it's a weapon the enemy wants to use. 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us about it. God has not given us a spirit of fear. What does that say? It means if I'm afraid it didn't come from God, I don't want anything from Satan, thank you very much. I don't care how he wraps it up and how he makes it smell and how he makes it look. If it's from him, I don't want it. And the Bible tells me fear is from, not from God. It must be from him. But it says that he's not given us a spirit of fear. Nope, that's the enemy. But of power and love and a sound mind. Tell yourself that. Tell yourself that out loud if you need to, that fear has no place. Fear has no place. I am a child of God. I have power, I have love, and I have a sound mind because I have Christ Jesus. And if you look at 1 John 4, 18, I love this verse. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. I want you for a moment to exchange the word love for the name of the one who's truly love. There is no fear in Christ, for Christ casts out fear. How awesome is that? You call on him, he's going to come in, he's going to clean house. He'll kick that fear out. Jesus is available. When fear comes knocking, let him answer the door. Let him answer the door. Trade that, I have no future, I have no hope for, I've got God. And if I've got God, I've got everything I could ever need. The third response is despair. Too often I see despair like it's like a wringing of the hands. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. The enemy would love nothing better than to convince you that there's nothing you can do. He wants to terrorize you into inaction. He wants to paralyze you and make you unable to move. He wants to overwhelm you with what seems to be reality. In truth, he's a tyrant whose days are numbered. And he's the one who's despairing. 
He's not showing up. He's the one despairing. He reads the times better than you and I do, and he knows his days are numbered and is acting like it. He's got nothing to lose and everything to gain. So he's fighting for all he's worth. The enemy is truly the one who's got the despair. He can see his, his demise on the horizon. He knows the days are getting increasingly shorter, and God, he knows, has a solution for our despair. He's got it right there, church. He's got it for you if you will use it. If you will use it. If you will put it into use, God is everything you need. Remember that verse in 1 Peter that we've, we've read in the past? The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What's the key word in that verse? You must know what it is. Like. He's like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's a phony. He's a fake. There's only one lion of Judah, and it ain't him. He's a phony. We've got to call him on it. Now, how in the world do we call him on it? We take a lesson right out of the old playbook of Jesus Christ. We use the word. We learn to use the word like an offensive weapon to drive the enemy back. And I'm not saying just wave it in front of him. That is not going to work. You know the story about me and a gun. It's not going to work. I can wave it at you, but I don't know how to use it. It doesn't do me any good to have the word of God if I'm just going to wave it about. I must use it. And that means I must jab at him, and I must poke at him, and I must stab at him, and I must puncture him with the word of God. Here's some verses you should grab onto and hang onto. I love this one verse when I read it. Every time I go through Psalms, I find myself looking at Psalm 42, verse 5. And God doesn't say it just in Psalm 42. He says it again and again. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Why are you despairing, soul? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. There will come a day where you stand and say, Thank you, God, for what you did. You did it. Put your hope in God, the author and the finisher of your faith. If you looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, remind yourself continually, God is faithful. God is faithful. We're not. We're not so much good at this faithful thing. We're far more fair weather. Oh, that we would grow in faithfulness like he is faithful. He always has a way of escape. He will always provide a way. The problem is, you and I grew up in a Burger King world. We're in a microwave instant world. I want it now. And I want it my way right now. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and see what God says. He says, I make all things beautiful in my time. In his time. God's clock is not our clock. But he has a plan. The key is, church, we've got to get our hand in his hand and hang on for all we're worth. To not let go, lest we be washed away. John was watching some show on PBS last night. This guy was jumping in the, I don't know what river he was jumping in, but it was a raging river. The Indies? The Ganges. And it was flowing fast. And they went in this really cold water. Why? I do not know. I wasn't really paying attention. I was just watching when they were, he, they had to hang on to a chain. The guy said, hang on to that chain when you go in. Otherwise, you'll find yourself downstream, a body, a dead body. We need to hang on to Christ because he's our lifeline. 1 Peter 5.7 is another verse you can put to memory. Casting all your care on him. For he cares for you. God loves you. God loves you. Make a trade with God. He gladly take your cares and give you his peace. I know that because I've done it. The situation might not change, but I promise you, you will. And how you're feeling and how you're thinking, it'll change. When you're afraid, when you're angry, when you're discouraged, when you're despairing, the best thing to do is get on your knees. Spend some time with God on your knees and you'll get up every time changed. So we should be angry. But it should be a righteous anger. We shouldn't give way to fear. Rather, we should find courage in the promises of God that he'll always be with us 
and that ultimately he's going to make all things right. And we shouldn't despair, but we should take action for change. We're the church. We're the people who bear the name of Jesus Christ. Now more than ever, our world desperately needs for Christians to stand up and march forward with hope, truth, and life that come from God. We can take advantage of what's going on in our world right now and begin to speak out about that hope and about that life that God offers. I don't know about you, I've begun to do that in my workplace. When the conversations come up and, and people begin to despair, I, I'm beginning to speak about that hope that I have that keeps me sane. We need to take advantage of the times. Now more than ever, our world needs Christ's love. We've got to prepare ourselves for the battle and we have to learn to use the tools he's provided. For way too long, the church has been polite. The church has not wanted to fight. The church has been quiet, squirreled up inside their buildings, inside their four walls. But guess what? The walls out there, they're being broken down. They're coming in here and they're taking, they're taking the war to the church. You've all heard about church shootings. They're coming to get us. For too long, we've been polite. We've not fought like a terrorist. We've not fought dirty. We've just been quiet and saying, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And God is saying, come on, church, wake up. It's time for us to fight. I'm tired of turning on my phone or my computer or my television and hearing about more lives being lost to senseless violence. I'm tired of it. And I've determined in me that I'm just going to start to make a stand and start to talk. Look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Let your light shine before men. We have got to understand, church, who we're called to be. He's describing us. And he goes on in, in the Beatitudes. He says, you're not supposed to light your light and hide it under a bushel basket. You're supposed to put it out where people can see it. Right. For too long, the church has shown their light in only one place, and that's in the church. Well, guess what? There's more than enough light in the church. We don't need to be showing it off here. We need to take it outside where it's dark. You all know by your basic sixth grade science, light repels darkness. It's time, church, for us to stand up, not to hide away our message, not to come here once or twice a week just to get our batteries recharged and to make it to the next Sunday or the next Wednesday. That's not what it's about. We're supposed to come here to be together in the presence of God to get recharged, to get out there in the world and work. And what would happen if today we all got fired up and we went out to we worked all of Monday and all of Tuesday pouring ourselves into God's work and blazing our light? You'd need to come back on Wednesday night just to get a recharge. And you get through Thursday and Friday and Saturday and come back and get recharged again. That's what we should be doing is coming here to recharge, to rub up against each other, to sharpen each other, to quicken each other, and then get back out there in the world. It's time, church. It's time. We're called to carry out the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, there they are. They, 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 they tell you what God has called us to do. Go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. Let's change that vernacular. We'll put it in the Sioux version. Go out and find your friends and bring them to me and introduce them to me because I want to be their friend too. Let me have a relationship with your friends. Take me with you where you go, and when you're with your acquaintances, would you introduce me? Would you stay with us while we build our relationship? Would you tell them about me so that I can have a firm relationship, a real relationship with them? That's what he's wanting us to do. It's time for us to light our torches and go on the offensive. God didn't give that message to the pastors and the teachers and the evangelists. He gave it to his children. That's you and that's me. 
And I can't speak for you, but I'm tired of seeing people walking around in fear and in despair and full of unrighteous anger. Especially when I have the answer in my heart and the answer in my mind. It's time for us all to get a little more boldly, in our, in our, a little more bold in our responses. While I was sitting at the computer writing out this message and, and letting it flow, an old song came to mind, and you know I like to put music up. And when I told Johnny, I said, oh, i got to find a song, don't I? I said, no, you don't. There's no song today. But I will reference a song. There's an old song. Gosh, it goes way back, but I didn't know that some famous people had made it into a song. I just knew that when I was in grade school in a Roman Catholic school, we sang this song based on St. Francis of Assisi. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. Not the peace that they're promising you in Washington. I'm a firm believer we'll never see that peace again until Christ returns. But his peace, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our Father, brothers and sisters are we. Let us walk with our brothers and sisters in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment with peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. It can, church. It should, church, begin with me. It should begin with you. Every step. How about it? How about we start a movement toward healing that our world needs? How about it begins with you and me? Remember Peter, shortly after he was filled with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost? He and John were walking to the temple one day, and they encountered by the, beautiful, by the gate beautiful a cripple laying there begging for alms. Remember what Peter had to offer him? What was it that led to the healing of that crippled man. It wasn't healing that Peter had. Listen to his own confession. Of silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. We have available to us exactly what Peter had. The name of Jesus Christ. How many of y'all saw War Room? Most of you saw it. I just love that little old lady. But you saw what she did in the face of fear. She spoke the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that that's not, that, that could just be a Hollywood thing. And I'm not saying it's going to work every time. That, that a guy's going to drop his gun and run. But I am going to say it's going to make a difference. And whether that guy turns and runs or whether that guy does something else, God is still on the throne. And God is still doing his work. We have the name of Jesus Christ. We have, if you have, a personal relationship with him, not just a head knowledge. doesn't do you any good to know about him. Remember the seven sons of Sceva, what happened to them? They used the name of, of Paul and got the snot beat out of them. Because they didn't have that power. They didn't have that relationship. They didn't have that authority. But if you have a living, vital, active relationship with Jesus Christ, you have what Paul had. You have what Peter had. And you have all that potential and all that ability to make a change in your world. You can do it. You can be an agent of healing in his name. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Jesus my Lord, in his name. If I'm walking with him on a daily basis, hand in hand, then he's mine. He's tied to me, and when I speak, he's right there to back it up. But if he's something I just encounter on Sunday and on Wednesday, and the rest of the days I'm going on my own, you got no backup. What kind of relationship would you have with anybody? If you spent two hours with them twice a week, Thomas, would she stay with you for four hours a week? Not if she's smart. No, it takes time. What does our world need more than it needs Jesus? 
Nothing. As I close this morning, I want to challenge you. Our world needs Jesus. He's hope. He is life. He's our redeemer. So when you're feeling angry, stop. Take it to the Father and say, God, I'm mad. I'm so angry I see red. I want to hurt something. God says, good. Good, I've got you right where I want you. I got, an, I got a target for your anger. There is something I want you to hurt too. It's the enemy. Blow directly at him. Fear. No more fear. We do not need to fear. We have the answer readily available to us. We just need to tell ourselves. We need to put the word of God in our heart. What the psalmist said, I've hidden your word in my heart. Why? So I might not sin against you, that I not do the wrong thing. We don't need to despair. We need to arm ourselves for battle. We need to determine to rise up. Rise up. If you've never met my Jesus, and if you sense a calling on your life, then I'd love the honor to introduce you to him. If anger or fear or despair or any other thing is robbing you of your joy and your peace, then don't sit there with it. Come and let's pray. Let's make a difference. If you need to be armed for the battle, if you're not feeling like you're quite ready to go into battle, then come. Come and let's pray. Let's start right now today. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy to all my fears are gone. Child.